everyone. My name is Evie Lupine. Welcome back to my channel. And today I have another video for you all. Today we are going to be talking about training for dominance. It is possibly a thing. And the reason why I wanted to talk about this is because I feel like in our community, we have a sort of fixation on training submissives. Like, there are three topics I get asked about all the time. One is punishments, two is power exchange, and three is training. People wanna know how to train their submissive, they wanna know how to be trained as a submissive, they wanna make sure they're going to the right training with the right person, they wanna make sure they are being taught everything they need to know in order to be a good, worthy, proper submissive. And I've made videos before talking about self-training for submissives and other ways to go about doing that. I think training as a submissive can be a good idea. It can also not necessarily be a good idea. And I don't think I've ever really heard anyone talk about training for dominance in the community as a regular thing or really focused on it at least until I randomly came across this blog article looking for something entirely unrelated to this and I was like oh this is actually a really interesting thought so I will go ahead and share this sort of spark that I read that made me want to talk about this and then we'll go from there we'll talk about different ways of training what a dom should be training for myths about training like just dominant relationships like how to become a dom basically it's gonna be a lot of stuff hopefully it'll be interesting anyways let's go ahead and read that article it's not really an article it's more of like a forum post but basically the important part of what is said in that is this quote in my opinion all the talk in bdsm circles about quote training a submissive is wrong-headed no standard training regime is required to be a good submissive partner. Though many subs I've met could stand a course on how to select a worthy dom, see how to interview a dom slash master. In reality, it is we doms who require the training, and not simply in how to wave a whip safely. Doms need training or knowledge and practice because we assume the authority in the relationship. The ability to retain and wield authority responsibly and consistently over time is not innate. There are no natural dominants. One must acquire and hone these skills, and doing so can take years. Even accurately perceiving your own words and tone as you speak can be challenging. And there's a lot I'm not including that this individual said. That's really the highlight I want to make that is relevant to the discussion for right now and right here. And on the one hand, I do agree with what they're saying. You know, like being a dominant takes a lot of work, not just like knowing how to use a whip or whatever, but also like knowing how you sound, knowing how to come across as dominant, developing confidence, all those kind of like softer skills too. And I like how they frame it. I like how they talk about, you know, you need to take on that role of training yourself because you are the one with the authority and that's a really powerful, meaningful thing to hold in a relationship. So like, make sure you're ready for it, basically. I don't totally agree with everything they're saying. I feel like this concept of there not being any like natural dominance is interesting because I think most people will look at a phrase like, oh, I'm a natural dom and what they mean by that is, oh, I'm a natural dom because I just have always been drawn towards dominance. I knew about it from a very young age. I've always like tried to do it in my relationships and, you know, I didn't have to be introduced to it. I was naturally driven towards that. I didn't like become a dom because like somebody else wanted me to, for example. But on another level, they are right. You know, like you don't pop out of the womb, you know, holding a, a golden flogger or a silver paddle or whatever. You know, like you do have to learn certain things. You can't just go, I'm dominant, now worship me. <laughs> like that's maybe as role play, that could be fun. But in real life, long-term relationships, yeah, not really a thing. I will also say, you know, on their point that like submissive training is useless past like a few like universal things and like interpersonal skills. I do think that 
if you are wanting to be a submissive and there's a path you want to go down. It is good to have certain skills in your back pocket, you know, like learn about your boundaries and being able to understand yourself. That is key because you're really the only one that can do that to start with. Like you have to know yourself first to be able to tell other people who you are and what you want. And also other things like being able to take criticism and take direction and like how to thoughtfully listen to an order. Like those are things that many people have to learn how to do if it isn't something that like comes very naturally to them. And then also, you know, yeah, like you could spend six months being trained by a master mentor or whoever and you know you you get trained in the arts of like you know victorian housekeeping and then you get your real dom that you're meant to have that you want to be in a relationship with and then you discover they don't really care about any of that and they actually want to keep a modern household and the, the, the role play and the costumes are not for them so like yeah you can devote a lot of time in training as a submissive and then not have it go anywhere because your partner isn't into that same thing. But I don't think that necessarily makes training in specific things universally useless, right? Like in the same way that doms have certain requirements for a relationship, certain like must have kink things, submissives can also have certain must have kink things. You know, I think people will idealize, you know, the ideal submissive is meant to be a blank slate, you know, a tabula rasa that is imprinted upon by the dominant and their pleasure comes from doing exactly whatever the dominant wants. They don't have any of their own thoughts or opinions or feelings at all. Like that's a fantasy. Some people definitely have that as a kink to be clear, but in reality, most submissives do have things they actually want to do and like want to be taught how to do. And I think this is something that's a carryover from vanilla dominant culture is like, oh, I want these things to happen to me, but I don't want to have to say anything. I just want them to happen. I don't want to have to communicate about it. We're just going to be so compatible that obviously if they're the one, the right person, they're just naturally going to want all the same things that I do. And so of course, if I train myself doing, you know, Victorian high protocol dinners, they're going to want that because if they're the one for me, they're also going to want that without having to like, communicate about it or anything else. They're, just, they're naturally going to be so impressed with all of my new skills. <sighs> In reality, it's not really how it works. Most people are not really a blank slate. So sorry, you do have to talk about the things you want before you actually get them. Because like I was saying, you know, submissives are not generally blank slates. They do have their own opinions, vaguely sometimes, about what they want. And if you were a submissive and you were dreaming of a Victorian high protocol household with fancy dinners and uniforms and then you show up on your dominance doorstep day one and they tell you to go like feed the pigs and here's a slop bucket you know you're gonna be pretty disappointed about that unless it's you know some kind of temporary debasing you know prove yourself to show that you're worthy to be in my household kind of thing maybe on a short-term basis somebody would like that but a lot of people are not going to be happy if what they want to be as a submissive is like a housekeeper and then they're told oh no no you're gonna be the farmhand you know take care of the animals for me sleep in the barn some people not going to be able to adapt to that one so you have to talk about what you want because you can't assume that just because you want something your partner's gonna like instantly know that and then also want the same thing like i think people have this fantasy where like they want to say i have no limits do whatever you want to me but then when you do whatever you want to them it's exactly what they want for however long they want it to happen and you know so on and so forth right like they want to somehow be given the exact thing they want without actually having to say anything about it so for submissives, very important to know before you get into a DS relationship, what do you actually want? Because your answer cannot be whatever my dominant wants. Do you want a 1950s household? Do you want a Victorian household? Do you want a household at all? Like have some basics known. I will just say as a final note, you know, if you as a submissive, you want to be able to have a relationship where you spit shine somebody's boots every day, you know, hey, take that class, learn about boot blacking, have that skill. 
You might be able to use it. You might not be able to find a partner who wants that right away or ever. But like if it's important to you and you want it as a submissive, why not show up in the relationship already having that skill in your back pocket so that way you can get started doing it as soon as possible. You know, like I feel like more knowledge, not necessarily a bad thing. And the fact that we overvalue people that don't come in with any kind of knowledge is a giant red flag in my opinion. But moving on, I do want to focus on dominance here and training for being a dominant because I do think that some kind of training or some kind of like just intentional educational pursuit is a good thing to do if you want to have power and control in a relationship because like we already talked about that's a pretty big responsibility but what I don't want to have happen because of making a statement like that is I don't want this to turn into some kind of like you must be at least this tall to ride the ride kind of thing where it's like oh no no you haven't trained enough you haven't done this and that and so therefore you can't be a real dominant like no it is very individual. Different people are going to commit to different levels of things. This is just a general guideline for what I think is a useful thing to do if you want to be a dominant. Because if you don't already know, we as a community have a long history of putting up these kind of like, oh, you need to do this to ride the ride kind of things. And people come up with all kinds of myths and stories about what doms are supposed to do. and. You know, one thing you'll see a lot is you will hear people bellyache about the leather days of yore, you know, of the 50s to the 80s, where everyone who was a dominant had to be trained by another master and you had to be somebody else's slave or submissive for a whole year at least before you could ever even consider being a junior grade dominant. And people did that. Some people did that. Certainly not all. A lot of people, even in the early days that were getting into doing, it wasn't BDSM back then, but, you know, we're getting into the work or getting into what it is that we do, you know, when they were getting into that, it was oftentimes the case that people would try things as they did today. You know, they'd try one thing and go, oh, not for me. I'm just a dom. Thank you very much. I'm just a top. Thank you very much. Like, sometimes you only have to try things a little bit to decide that they're not really for you. And I've talked about this in videos before, but I think this idea that, you know, you have to spend a year as a submissive before you can truly be worthy of being a dom. There's a good intention there, but I think it has a lot of very negative side effects, right? Like, go to any party, watch a dominant, volunteer themselves proudly to submit themselves to their friend's new flogger because uh, it's just flogging. How can that be a big deal? It's easy. And then they take the flogging and they go, they turn to their sub or their partner and go, you let me do that to you? That was, that was horrible. That was, I hate that so much. Like I have seen multiple cases of dominants that are dominant and top through and through. And they experience bottoming one time for 20 minutes as like a trial. And they're like, I could never do that again. That was awful. And so to force someone to do something they genuinely don't enjoy for a year. For what purpose? Just to prove themselves as like a rite of passage? Like that's going to turn so many people away from the community ever really being dominant because of how repulsed and how like upset and horrible they would feel having to be in that position or experience certain things. Like it can be useful and helpful for understanding how a sub might feel about certain things to like know what it's like to experience a flogger or what that paddle feels like, like, or the intensity level of it. That knowledge is good to have. It can be gotten certain ways through other means. And you know, unless you're a switch, if you are dominant, who is learning how to be a submissive as a dominant, you're not learning how to be a submissive or what being a submissive feels like. The way a submissive would experience it, you are learning what it feels like to be a dom that has to act like a submissive for a period of time. And some people will fully go into the role and they will become a submissive and then emerge with a new perspective. Like, I feel like that's something in like the Sleeping Beauty trilogy where it's like, oh, you go to this land and you like, you know, you're a, you're a submissive for everyone for a period of time and you come back and you get to be a leader or a princess or a queen or a king again or whatever. Like, I feel like that's a thing in those books. But like, just because it happens in a fantasy novel doesn't mean that it actually really helps out in real life. And 
again, I think people did do that to a certain extent. And certainly to say there are people that will have that kind of training protocol. But we very much like to have myths around us as a community. And sometimes it even goes a level deeper than like, oh, in the 50s, everyone who was a dom had to be trained as a submissive first. Like, there are legends that people will share that supposedly, you know, in the good old fashioned BDSM days, we had European training chateaus that you'd go there and you'd learn and become a perfect dominant. And there were these houses of domination where for generations people would dominate and submit. And it was this beautiful, almost holy experience. And like saying it out loud, that has to sound kind of ridiculous, right? Like that sounds something Marquis de Sade would write, you know? Like that sounds like something that doesn't really exist, but self-made legends die hard. People love their mythology for their culture, and in kink, there is not an exception to that. People really love holding on to their stories, and people think that that's real, and I don't really know how because we don't really have any concrete evidence those things ever actually existed, like physical locations. All we have is the kind of vague, like, oh, in the European houses of old, we would do this and that. And it's like, like, what, like, give me a name, give me a city, give me a, like, a little, a little villa in Germany somewhere where this supposedly happened. Because, like, if these were truly around for decades and centuries and generations, you think we'd, we'd have some more concrete evidence, but alas. We do not. And I believe it's Guy Baldwin has done a lot of work to dispel myths about the leather community and like these like old training houses and all of that. Like, you know, it's something that we create because I think we want to seem legitimate and see, you know, we want things to be more complicated and interesting than just like a bunch of freaks got together and decided to party. <laughs> Like, you know, that's almost, that's not a very interesting story. But, you know, oh, for generations we had this history in Europe. You know, that's much more exciting and much more entertaining. So we adapt it. We treat it as real. And unfortunately it is not. But it doesn't mean it's not a fun fantasy or something to replicate in a role play scenario if you want to do that. So unfortunately, I cannot send you all to any training chateaus. I cannot send you to any kind of, you know, program abroad to study for a year. It's not really a thing that exists. And in fact, I will say this. Uh, you know, sometimes things are based on a kernel of truth. And in this case, the kernel of truth is that there are houses of domination. They're ran by pro-doms as a business, not for pleasure as like, you know, my, my generational thing is to like be in a house of domination. And that's like my whole life is to be that, you know, for years and years and like, you know, on and on throughout time. Like, no, it's a job because it pays. And I know that there is a place in nor the Northeast that is called, I think it's La Domain SMR, and they market themselves as the oldest training chateau for BDSM, and it's only like 30 years old, less than 30 years old even, and if it's only 30 years old, that's like the early 90s. It's not that old. Like, this isn't, we're not talking about, like, the 17th century in France, you know. So, even stuff that we know exists, as like a concrete thing. Their lineage is only, like, 30 years. So, you know, there's a grain of truth, but it's not as exciting as, like, European castles filled with people doing cake, you know. If only. Fun role play, once again, but not actually reality. So, if you are a dominant and you do want to do self-training and you don't want to do the whole, like, you know, year in a day, being a submissive kind of thing, what can you actually do? I think number one is you can definitely pursue mentorship. A little star there. Mentorship. <sighs> mentorship is very complicated because the good people that are worth learning from have the least availability. They have partners, they have family, they're training other people, they teach, they travel, they got life going on. There's lots of people out there that'll be more than happy to say, oh, I'd love to train you to be a dominant, to be like me. People like that generally don't have very good intentions, don't have a great reputation, 
And oftentimes their goal is, is I want to have somebody that I can mold to be like me as a dominant because I think there is one way of being a dominant and I want to teach what that way is. Or I got kicked out of here or these people don't like me. So I'm going to train someone that can be alongside me in my fight against these other groups and other people and places that don't like me, you know, and get to them before they know better and hear about my bad reputation. And certainly there are people that have great skills that are great at bondage and whips and floggers and all that that are more than happy to teach you doesn't actually make them a good person. And also, I think especially with dominance, there's a desire to like get the right person to learn everything from. And like I've been making YouTube videos about kink for how many years now? And I'm not done yet, not even close to it. There's a lot to know about kink. And finding a mentor who has enough overlap with your own kink interest that is available that can teach you is very difficult. It is impossible to learn everything from one person. I think you can get kind of the gist and the basics about like consent and negotiation, you know, exploring what a dungeon is like, learn the basic tools of the trade, but a single mentor, a single other person in the community cannot teach you everything. So please do not fall for the trap of thinking that once you learn from one person, you know everything, even if it's me, even in fact, especially if it's me, you know, don't, I'm, I'm an internet person. I don't even talk to you guys directly in like real life, you know, to be able to teach you how to do certain things. So, you know, don't take any single person's word for it. Learn from multiple sources where possible. I think one-on-one -on -one mentorship has a lot of benefits, but be aware of the downside. I think another thing to look for that maybe is a better option than mentorship is to look for weekend retreats and intensives. You know, there are people, I believe, oh, the name escapes me, but I think they do intensives and trainings as well, especially for DS, but there are options for doing a two or three day long event where you go to like an Airbnb or somebody's house or something and you just learn the entire time. You know, you have a whole day, you have a break for lunch, you know, you're learning different skills, you're talking to people, you have support groups, discussion groups. And I think those can be very valuable because it allows you to just fully get immersed in that world. You know, you're not constantly getting distracted by work or kids or whatever. You know, you have the ability to just like fully get into that, learn a whole lot in a short period of time and not have to find like seven different classes to learn as much as you would learn potentially over the course of a whole weekend. It can be cost prohibitive. Not everyone running them is a good person or worth learning from, but it is definitely worth looking into as an option. Another thing is closely related to this, conventions. Love conventions, love talking about them, love going to them. Conventions for kink are a really great way to learn. And increasingly more and more conventions are offering things like Friday intensives where you have maybe half a day or a whole day just learning one skill like high protocol or beginning in a DS relationship or some kind of edge play, for example. Not quite to the same level as you would get with maybe like a full weekend long intensive on one topic, but a really good way to learn some more skills that are maybe hard to learn on your own that you want to have direct feedback about or just are things that are like, you know, some of us live in studio apartments and we can't really get the space to learn how to set a full Victorian dinner table for eight and we can only get that at a convention. So those are a good option there as well. And then if you do want to do some self-directed study, that's also totally valid. There's so much online now with like blogs and podcasts and you know, YouTube videos. There's all kinds of ebooks and audiobooks. So many things to learn from if you are more motivated and self-directed. Of course, when you're reading books, you're not really getting the in-person one-on-one experience you would get. You know, you can't, you know, to a certain extent, you can learn how to do bondage from a book. You can't really learn it the same way you would learn in like a weekend long intensive about the topic. So it does have limitations to do more self-directed study. I think if you want to get the most out of it, keep notes, keep a journal about it. You know, what did I learn today? What did I learn this week? Highlight things that are really important for you. To this day, I go back and I reference things that I highlighted or I learned about early on in my kink career that are just always stuck with me as like little things in my brain of like, oh, that's an important idea. So keep track for you of what those ideas are because they can be so influential to your experience of kink. And then also, I will say the advantage of doing this more self-directed study is it's a lot easier and cheaper to learn from many, many different people. Like there are 
five different authors out there talking about DS relationships. Find one that has a voice that resonates with you. Learn from the other ones too, because even though you maybe don't fully jive with somebody, I think you can still learn things that are worth learning about from that person. And, you know, don't discount somebody just because initially maybe they don't fully seem like they are on the same page style-wise as you. And besides self-directed learning with reading or podcasts or videos, one other big thing you can do as a dominant to help train yourself in a fashion is to do therapy. And I'm sure a couple of you were waiting to hear that from me, but I really do think that therapy can be a big thing to do, especially if you've never done it before. Therapy is a very powerful process. You don't have to have anything like concretely wrong with you to benefit from doing therapy. And you could also look at things like personal coaching or community support groups or group therapy sessions. Maybe like individual one-on-one -on -one therapy isn't accessible to you or you don't want to do that for whatever reason, but something along those lines and especially individual therapy itself, I think is something that dominants can benefit from for reasons they don't necessarily consider up front. I think a lot of dominants, without even realizing it, are drawn to dominants at least partly because they enjoy playing a certain role in a relationship. Like they wanna be the fixer. They wanna be in control. They wanna have the authority so that way they can't be questioned. They are beyond reproach. What they say is law, they can't be wrong, and they also can't have anything wrong with them. That's the part people don't always think about is dominance can be a shield, a protective force, so that way you aren't inspected, you aren't questioned, you are just taken as the authority. And because of that, that means many people have a perspective on their DS relationships that basically amounts to like, you know, I get to help you, you can't help me. I get to look at you and your problems and help you be better. And you know, I am already great. So what could possibly be wrong with me? Don't look too closely, please. And it's in those moments where you get the benefit from an individual therapist that can help sit with you and help you process things that maybe you've been avoiding processing. And doing that work before you get into a DS relationship can be very, very good to do because you don't necessarily know until you get into it maybe what baggage you have, what schemas you have, maybe things from past relationships, past BDSM experiences that could be lurking right there under the surface that if you don't address them could really damage your future relationships. There isn't shame around it. I think especially a lot of dominant men have a lot of shame around like therapy and like feeling broken and wrong and like therapy is only for people that are really bad and I'm fine, you know, you know, it's like pretty much everyone I think can benefit from therapy, so why not try it, you know? That's, that's my opinion, but if you're looking at anything else besides therapy, I think it's also worth thinking about what you focus on in your training. Like, what kind of things can you learn as a dominant when you are training yourself or pursuing training? I think you can look at like hard skills, for example, so that would be like vlogging, how to do bondage, you know, how to use a whip, how to paddle somebody, things like that. This is, I think, what most people kind of like naturally know how to do as a dominant in terms of like things I should just learn, you know, like I should learn how to do these things. And like, it's easy to fill up a classroom about like how to use a flogger. It's a lot harder to fill up a classroom when you're talking about like how to navigate communication issues or heart to heart communication, things like that, you know? So softer skills also worth looking at you know developing your confidence how to use your dom voice how to have a presence in a room how to cultivate what you want to be as a dominant how to set down and draw out what your values are what you want to steer your future relationships and you as a person right are you someone who really values like community service are you someone who really values generosity like what do you want to have steer your relationships? Looking at values, looking at soft skills, I think besides just like hard skills in the sense of like flogging, I think also things like first aid are great to have, you know, first aid, emergency preparedness, you know, cause when you're, especially at home, you can have the best intentions and be playing it as safely as possible and things can still go wrong. So knowing how to deal with things, if you like, drop a candle by accident or someone starts to choke or go unconscious or like whatever, you know, knowing how to deal with those things, 
great thing to do. I also think that learning about your own needs as far as things like aftercare, for example, or praise or how you want to be addressed. Those things are important to know as well because they are something that a submissive can't necessarily teach you about yourself. Some of it is going to be determined in relation with your partner, but a lot of it, especially for like aftercare, for example, that's kind of you, right? Like, do you need solo time? Do you need partner time? Do you want to go out to dinner? Do you want to take a nap? Like, do you need aftercare? Do you want aftercare? What might that look like to you? Making those kinds of determinations. I also think things like learning how to be a good listener are always like good skills to have like a lot especially again you know a lot of dominants they have a pattern that contributes to why they get into being a dominant and for a lot of people part of that pattern is they want to be a fixer they want to okay you're telling me something let's fix it it's basically a trope in like marriage therapy at this point i feel like for people to be like he never listens to me she never listens to me she always just wants to get right to it and a lot of people are very uncomfortable sitting with other people's uncomfortable emotions right if you see somebody is sad or upset about something the instinct is to like oh no like for some people at least is to shut it down and go no, we're not going to feel it anymore we're going to get rid of that we're going to fix it we're going to solve it and to leap right into fixing so learning how to be comfortable with other people's intense emotions because especially when you're doing kink you're going to be interacting with other people's very intense emotions so you might want to learn that skill okay and also just learning how to navigate difficult topics before they come up right so things like navigating how to write a contract that could be learning how to navigate the ending of a relationship if at some point you do end a power exchange relationship how to recognize the signs of a toxic relationship before it becomes fully toxic. This could also be things like what to do when a scene goes wrong. You know, what happens when your partner calls red? What happens after that said? You know, how do you provide aftercare for a partner if something has gone very wrong? How do you recover from that in your relationship? And there are a bunch of other things to learn, but all of it really contributes to how to build a long-term sustainable DS relationship that leaves the people in it better than when they started. And there's more I could talk about, but I just started filming with a new camera and apparently the battery life on it is very short and I have limited options for charging it. So we are gonna wrap it up there for today. I hope that this all helped you learn how to navigate being a dom and doing training as a dominant. You don't have to do training to be a worthwhile dom by any stretch of the imagination, but if you do choose to do training, it can be a very beneficial thing to do. You don't have to wait until you're like this old or have been doing BDSM for this long to be a worthy dominant, but learning more, I think, gives you just more knowledge about yourself, about things in general, and more knowledge is powerful, and that helps you have a better kink experience. With all that being said, thank you all so much for watching. I'd love to know your thoughts in a comment down below. If you did enjoy this and are ready, please do subscribe because I make videos twice a week about all sorts of different kink and BDSM related topics, and Finally, if you want to support what I do, the best you can do is with Patreon. Link to that will be down below. Thank you so, so much. If you already do support over there, it means the absolute world to me. And until I see you all next time, I hope you have a great rest of your day and a great rest of your week. Bye-bye.